Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up this week, as the UCI Super World Championships comes to a close with the Elite Women's Road Race, I'll be going through that as well as the time trials, XCO Mountain Biking, the National Cycling League from Denver, and another flurry of transfer news. This week in the world of racing, we learnt that the type of gel you get in a mountain bike race is very, very important. Oh dear, Koretsky. Whatever that was, it wasn't what he wanted. He wanted an orange one and he got a lemon one. Yeah, it's always a nightmare. And uh, one of them rhubarb and custard ones, but I'm not happy with it. That was Victor Correcci of France. Clearly not happy, although no need to take it out on your helper, Victor. And finally, we learned that Lotta Kopecki was the most successful athlete at the inaugural UCI Super World. Fresh, if you can call it that, off the back of two golds on the track, Kopecki started yesterday's road race as the big favourite and duly delivered. The 156 kilometer race was fast and frenetic pretty much from start to finish. A really threatening group went clear even before they got to the Crow Road climb. Shabby, Labousse, Dignan and Mormon Pascio were amongst those forging clear, but with those behind sensing the danger, they were reeled in over the top of that climb. The Dutch squad were already weakened by the time they got to the Glasgow circuits with Voss and Vibes out the back, and it was always going to be a very hard chase given the nature of the circuits and the speed at which they were ridden. Just over the midway point, Switzerland's Elise Shabby was at it again. Kind of felt like she spent more time off the front than she did in the peloton itself, counter-attacking a move from Kopecki and going clear solo. Now, 75Ks is a long way to go, but a combination of the rides behind watching each other and Shabby on a brilliant day meant she was able to build up a maximum lead of a minute and a half. Without Justin Gaker working for Belgium, the result could have been very different indeed. The 27-year-old is fairly new to cycling, but we've already seen how strong she was earlier this season, and she was instrumental in the outcome of the race. Once she'd finished her job, the attack started flying again. Annemiek van Fleurten had already had to come back twice from mechanicals, but she was still able to go on the attack, and when that didn't work out, she contributed to the chase behind, presumably working for Demi Vollering a cohesive Dutch women's team, who would have thought today? Eh? Further attacks from behind brought the gap to Shabby down to under the half minute mark, but it wasn't until just over a lap to go that she was finally caught. Diagnan and Schweinberger were the next to go, but a group of six came back together with just over half a lap remaining. Utrup Ludwig tried her luck there, knowing she wouldn't be able to out-sprint Kopecky, but the Belgian went over the top and immediately opened up a gap. It was never huge, but also the result never looked in doubt from that point on. Kopecky rode away to her first elite women's world road title and the first for Belgium in over 50 years. Behind, Utrup Ludwig was caught by Vollery, who took the silver medal, with a Dane having to settle for the bronze. This is how the top 10 looked. Roeser in fourth, Schweinberger outsprinting Diagnan for fifth. Shabby held on for seventh on the day. Van Fleurten rounded out her world's career with eighth, Marcus ninth and Garcia tenth. Just outside the top 10 was Blanca Vash, who won the under-23 world title ahead of Van Androoy and Shackley. For Kopecky, it was the third world title in just one week. She also won the elimination and points races on the track. Adding the Tour of Flanders, Omloop Het Newsblad, a stage and second overall at the Tour de France fam, plus many other wins, and I think it's safe to say, she has had an incredible season. On to the time trials now. In the men's, 19-year-old Josh Charling was setting the benchmark for the more established stars to try and beat behind him. Uh, the Brit flew around the course, beating the current best time by over a minute as he crossed the finish line. Behind him, Van Aert and Kung were unable to go faster, but two riders were going better through the intermediate splits. Those two riders were Filippo Ganna and Remco Avenepoel. Uh, Ganna was the first to beat the Brits' time, putting 36 seconds into him, but Avenepoel stormed around the course with an average speed just short of 52 kilometers per hour to win the gold medal by 12 seconds. Avenepoel is only the second ever rider to have won both the men's elite time trial and road world championships. Abraham Alano, the other one, back in the 90s. In the women's, with Chloe Dygert, one of the early starters, she was always going to be sat in the hot seat for quite a long time. Uh, despite being ill on the lead up to the event, she blitzed around the course, and as the bigger names began their race, it became very clear she was going to be very hard to beat. 
Vollering was some way off the pace, whilst Ruusa pulled out between time checks one and two, citing mental fatigue. Uh, the rider who was pushing Daigert closest, though, was Australia's Grace Brown. But the clock turned red just before the finish line for her, which she crossed six seconds slower than the American. Christina Schreinberger rounded out the podium in what was a very successful week for the Australian, of course, who finished fifth in the road race as well. I'll move on now to the National Cycling League, or NCL. The second of three rounds took place in Denver yesterday evening and saw the men's race come first. Just a reminder here, points are gained in the qualifying race and again during the final, where they're available every time they cross the finish line. The final time they cross the line though, it offers a massive bonus for the first across it. 30 points versus just the eight if you are second. You're also allowed to substitute riders when you wish at the changeover point on the lap and there were some very different tactics last last night versus what we saw in the first round earlier this year. The Denver Disruptors dominated most of the men's race, picking up a lot of points throughout it, and initially it looked like they'd continued in that vein at the finish line, with Reinhard Jans van Rensburg taking the massive 30 points for crossing it first. That's what we thought anyway. However, after reviewing the finish line photo, it was actually Miami Knights who pipped him, Alfredo Rodriguez out sprinting him to the line. The same two teams dominated the women's event, with the gap holding steady between the two teams overall, about 18 to 20 points. Denver did close to 16 points with four laps remaining, but that had gone back up to 20 as the bell rang, signalling one lap to go. And it had extended a lot more than that at the finish line. Miami Knights finished 1-2 with Paola Munoz and Jade Praderas taking a big overall win on the day. Uh, the first ever National Cycling League will conclude this coming Sunday night, where the prize pot of over a million dollars on the line, there is going to be a lot of pressure and a lot on the line. Just 11 points separate those top two teams going into it. Meanwhile, here in Europe, as our eyes look towards the third and final men's Grand Tour of the year, the Vuelta a España, we have the warm-up race that many choose ahead of it. The Vuelta a Burgos runs for five days from tomorrow through to Saturday, and Primoz Roglic will be there for Jumbo Visma. He hadn't previously planned to race ahead of the Vuelta, but we'll definitely get an idea of his form because he'll be up against the likes of Adam Yates, Jay Vine, Damiano Caruso and Alexander Vlasov. Also starting tomorrow and running through to Saturday is the Tour of Denmark and it'll be Little Trek that is the team to beat there. Pedersen, Skjelmos and Skoind are all competing, whilst Krau Andersson and Kurt Nielsen will be amongst the other Danes looking to take a win on home soil. Fabio Jakobsen will be there for Sudal Quickstep in the sprints. Uh, one more race for tomorrow is the Tour of Leuven, or the Grote Praise Jeff Skierens. Arno Dele, Arno Demar, and Dan McClay are all on the provisional start list there. Uh, would you like a fourth race to watch tomorrow? Because we've got one. The four day Tour de Limousin. Local hopes there will include Cosnefois, Vaucola, Venturini, and Grégoire, whom I'm most excited to watch. Looking a little further ahead, the Arctic Race of Norway runs from Thursday through to Sunday, although the provisional start list is a little bit threadbare at the moment, with most teams still to announce their rosters. Whilst on Sunday, we have Germany's big one-day classic, the BMSC Classics. Koi, Grunewagen, Malia, Ewan Bennett and Matthews are just some of the sprinters looking for success there, whilst Marco Haller will be there trying to defend his crown. Uh, Sunday also marks the start of the Tour de l'Avenir, which this year should have live coverage of every single stage. It's an event which normally gives us a very good idea as to who the stars of the future might be, and this year, for the first time, it will be followed by the inaugural women's race. And if all that wasn't enough, we've also got the PTO Asian Open Triathlon event this weekend from Singapore, with the women's race on Saturday and the men's race coming on Sunday. So, rather a lot to watch on GCN Plus this week. There are some territory restrictions though, so please check if that is available where you are. I'll wrap up some of the other races from last week now, starting with the XCO World Champs from Glentress. In the men's, all road fans' eyes were on Sagan, Pidcock and Van der Poel. But whilst a crash after six hours in the road race didn't prevent the Dutchman from winning, a crash after six minutes in the mountain bike race did. In fact, it put him out of the race before it had even really begun. It had begun in rather controversial circumstances because just one day before the race, the UCI announced a rule change that would allow those three riders to start a little further up the grid. Uh, gridding makes a big difference, of course, in mountain bike and cross racing because the start is so hard and it's very hard to get past people once you hit the single track and technical sections. Uh, Pidcock did come out after the race to say that he thought it was a terrible decision by the world's governing body. I don't think it made a huge difference to the result, to be honest. Uh, Sagan was never really in the frame. Funderpool crashed out, as I said. And judging by the way Pidcock rode, he could have started dead last and still caught the leaders before the finish. 
Nino Schurter, consistent as ever, was always at the forefront, but his group was joined by the Brit around midway through the race. After taking a couple of laps to catch his breath and assess the competition, Pidcock put in a couple of digs on the climbs and distanced the 10-time world champion. And it wasn't Schurter who was his closest challenger in the end. Sam Gaze was also fighting his way through the field and looking incredibly strong. After passing Schurter, it even looked like he might close to Pidcock, but it wasn't to be. Uh, Pidcock became the first ever British male rider to win the race and the first to even podium since David Baker back in 1992. In the women's, there was little doubt as to who the winner would be after just a couple of laps of racing. Pauline ferrand Prevost quickly made up for a relatively poor start, finally going into the lead after passing her French teammate Loana Lecomte. Uh, ferrand Prevost's lead was already 14 seconds by the end of that second lap and continued to grow through much of the rest of the race. One minute and 14 seconds was her margin of victory over Lecomte by the finish. So a French one too, with Puck Pizza of the Netherlands taking the bronze. Uh, that was Ferrand Prevost's fourth world title in five years and her fifth in total. She also won the short track two days beforehand with Sam Gaze winning the men's event there. I'll run through a few of the results from the track races now. Ethan Vernon won the elimination race for Great Britain ahead of Bibic and Viviani. Harry Lavrason won the men's sprint finals. Again, that was his fifth sprint title in a row and his 13th world championship rainbow jersey. Nia Evans and Eleanor Barker won the Women's Madison. In that event, there was a crash late on and the race was neutralised with just under two laps to go, which seemed utterly bizarre. Uh, it was wound back to nine laps to go, which is when the crash happened, and Barker talked about how the doubts crept back in during the short break. Georgia Baker and Alex Manley got second for Australia and the Pukalik sisters picked up the bronze for Poland. There was a second world title for Jennifer Valente of the USA, who added the Omnium to the scratch race that she'd won the previous week. And there was also a rare gold for Colombia in the Kieran. Kevin Quintero causing a bit of an upset by beating the sport's big stars in the final there. Uh, Colombia incidentally last won that event back in 2018, but since then, the Netherlands have basically had a stranglehold over it. Transfer news now, and I'll start with Terry Gagenhart, long rumoured to be joining Lidl Trek, and that move was confirmed by Ryder and team last week on what is a three-year deal. The team has also added Jonathan Milan and Clara Capone to their roster, as well as extending the contract of Quinn Simmons. Another man on the move is Warren Bargill. He signed a three-year deal too to go back to the team he started in the pro ranks with, Team DSM. It'll be very interesting to see how he gets on back there. Ethan Vernon is yet another rider on a new three-year contract. He signed up to Israel Premier Tech, whilst Group Arman announced three new recruits, Sven-Erik Bistrom, along with the French duo of Clément Rousseau and Remy Rojas. Mavi Garcia is set to join Jaco Alula from 2024, whilst Ida Schelling moves from Bora Hansgrohe to Astana. And finally, Arkea Samsic have added another rider in the form of Clément Venturini. I'm going to finish this week's racing news show though with a tribute to the great Federico Bahamontes who passed away last week at the age of 95. Known as the Eagle of Toledo, Bahamontes is widely regarded as one of the best climbers, if not the best climber of all time. He was the first to do the triple crown of KOMs, winning that classification at least once in all three of the Grand Tours, but he also took cycling's ultimate prize, winning the Tour de France overall in 1959. Throughout his career, he won a total of 11 Grand Tour stages, and our condolences go to everybody that knew him. That is all for this week. I'm off to watch another packed week of racing, but I'll be back here this time next week.